Hi, everyone, and welcome to PRISM's webinar, Strategies to Increase Self-Engagement and Independent Play in Children with Smith-McGinnis Syndrome. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us here this evening. I know that may not be easy for all of us to do right now. These are challenging times for everyone and especially SMS parents. My name is Allison Stefanok, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'm a PRISM's board member, and I'm also a mom to an incredible nine-year-old with Smith-McGinnis Syndrome. This webinar is brought to you by PRISMS. PRISMS is an acronym for parents and researchers interested in Smith-McGinnis syndrome. PRISMS is an advocacy, education, and support organization for individuals with SMS, their families, and the professionals who serve them. A recording of this webinar and all past webinars, as well as a listing of future webinars, can be found on prisms.org under the Education tab. If you have any questions for our speaker during the webinar, you can type it into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll take some time to answer as many questions as we can, but we might not get to all of them. So tonight we'll be talking about strategies to increase self-engagement and independent play for children with Smith-McGinnis syndrome. Anissa Moore is our speaker this evening, and Anissa is an independent educational consultant and licensed board certified behavior analyst specializing in the field of ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, emotional disturbance, oppositional defiance disorder, and other challenging behavior disorders. She is also a certified teacher and an administrator with over 25 years of experience. Welcome, Anissa, and thank you so much for being with us here this evening. We're, of course, all living through a pandemic right now. The special needs population, especially those living with behavior disorders like SMS, are facing really extraordinary challenges. Uh, many families have lost the supports that are truly necessary to keep daily life going. Uh, schools have closed or gone virtual. Uh, regular caregivers and extended family members may not be available. And this all happened overnight. So the caregiver needs of an SMS person can be overwhelming. And independent play isn't typically something that SMSers are very good at. So, and unfortunately now, independent play is more important than ever. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate, really appreciate it. Thank you. It is my pleasure. Thank you, Allison. And welcome everybody to our webinar tonight. Again, my name is Anissa Moore. And in the short hour that we have, we are going to be covering a lot of information about self-occupancy and what that looks like. Um, I know we probably have a lot of families out there with a, a varying degree of, of student ages. You know, your kiddo might be still very young, and then I'm sure we also have some families that have older students um, still at home. So I'm hoping that I can capture um, all the different age groups and all of the different uh, challenges that a lot of y'all might be experiencing. Um, not just the regular day to day at home, but as Allison said, I think we've all kind of felt the impact of um, kids feeling cooped up and us feeling cooped up and how can we keep them engaged at home? How can we um, keep them interested in different tasks and in different activities? But the bigger challenge is always how can we keep them self occupied? Uh, can, do they know how to play by themselves, to do kinds of leisure activities by themselves, besides just, you know, watching the TV or a movie or playing their video game six hours a day. So I'm hoping to give you um, some strategies. A lot of it is going to be work up front, okay? But nothing good ever came from, uh, you know, easy work. This is gonna be a little bit of work up front, but think about it, you're already doing a lot of work now. I mean, you're already having to redirect and hey, go over here and why don't you play with this and, you know, give mom alone time or give dad alone time. You know, you're already doing a lot of that. So the work you're gonna do now is going to be adding structure and predictability and understanding to play and leisure. And then once you have that structure set up, you can kind of back off and then let your child take over and then they know better how to play, how to self-engage and both you and your kiddo and the siblings are going to benefit. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen for this evening. Okay. All right, I 
hope everybody can see my screen. So this is strategies to increase self-engagement in independent play for our kiddos with SMS. Our agenda for tonight, again, in the short amount of time we have together, um, we've kind of already covered a little bit of the introduction, so we can probably cross that off our list. I'm gonna talk about the importance of play and leisure and how it relates to independence and independent skills. Um, again, no matter what age your child is, these are things and skills that can be harnessed and developed as they continue to grow. We're also gonna talk a lot about how we can build on our child's areas of interest and expand play activities. I'll show you how you can do different structuring of areas, structuring of tasks. And when I say tasks, it's not work. It's the actual play task. I'm gonna give you some examples for that as well tonight. And then the teaching component of this, okay? Because we can't just tell our kids, hey, you need to go in your room and play for a little bit, all right? You need to play for at least 10 or 15 minutes and then you can come back out. You know, it's, it's not that simple. And uh, the more that we can structure and teach and demonstrate um, how this looks, and then we ask our child to demonstrate it back to us, then we can get into that independent practice play. We'll talk a little bit about maintaining motivation, and then toward the end, we'll have a Q&A. Now, you'll see um, on your screen that we do have a Q&A box. We don't have the chat box, but a Q&A box has been, um, is on there. So anytime during the training, uh, during the seminar tonight, you can pop in a question that you have. And then toward the end, after we get toward the end of our slides, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A. And I'm happy to help in any way that I can with that. This is an activity that we were going to do as a group, but because there's so many people registered tonight, and I'm thrilled about that. I'm absolutely thrilled about that. I'm just going to tell you quickly about this activity. Um, this is actually an activity um, called Hilo, and I'm not sure if any of y'all have heard about that or played it. It's not really a game. It's more of a way to communicate with your child. I even do this with my own daughter who's 13 years old. Um, have you ever asked your child when they come home from school, hey, how was your day? Or how was school today? And if you have a child that has some, some verbal skills, a lot of times you're going to get the answer back of fine, okay, things like that, which obviously doesn't tell you what's going on at school. So an area that you can really develop language skills and also get a little bit of information about your child's day, whether they were at school or whether they were virtual learning at home, or whether it was a weekend and you guys were doing some play, whether they were doing independent play or there was some, some family play time, some games, whatever it may be. But this is called Hilo. So you would ask the child, you would teach the child, what is a high? Um, like, what is the best part of the day? What was the funnest part of the day? Um, what, what was the time that you were most happy? That's a high. And then the low part, what was the lowest part of the day? Maybe a part that was frustrating or upsetting or, um, you know, made them angry. And you can even use visual strategies to ask this question. So you can say, what was your high today? What was your low? And you can do this as well. You can say, okay, you know, I'm going to start. I'm mom. I'm going to start. Uh, my high today was, and this is a true story, y'all. My high today was um, I had some errands to run today, and I went through the Starbucks line, and they already have pumpkin spice lattes. So I had to buy one. I broke down. I had to buy one because it's already fall. So that was my high today. And my low today, um, I think, was not finishing a report that I really tried to finish today. That was my low. Okay, now it's your turn. Tell me what your highest and what your lowest. So that's kind of that activity. So we're not going to do this as a group in the interest of time and our awesome big group tonight. But I want you to just think for a minute, what was your high today and what was your low? And the reason we do this too is not just to encourage language and communication between uh, families and caregivers and their child, but also again to kind of hear what is making our kids happy. We get specific details. What is frustrating for our child? So take a minute to do that. And then I'm gonna switch to the next screen. 
this is also a great activity that you can do with your spouse or significant other um, to kind of, if, if you just have five minutes to talk to them with all the chaos and craziness of the day, um, if you just have those five minutes to sit down on the couch and y'all play high, low, Hey, this was my high, this was my low. At least you're keeping some of that communication going. <laughs> my husband and I do this quite a bit. Okay, friends, let's talk about the importance of self occupancy in play and leisure. So first of all, research supports that play, especially with our younger kiddos play encourages cerebral development and problem solving skills. Play can also decrease what we call non functional behavior. So if you've got, you know, your child that does the hand rubbing consistently, which we know is is a huge component of SMS, or if you've got a student that is um, has some self stimming behavior, or if you've got a student that is that is playing with something um, non functionally, you know, if they're banging something like a baby doll against the table versus actually playing with the baby doll. When we teach those self occupancy um, play skills and leisure skills that will decrease that non functional behavior and it turns it into functional play skills. It also eliminates boredom. We know, and this is true of almost any kiddo, but especially kiddos with special needs and kiddos with behavior challenges, when boredom, boredom kicks in, we see more behaviors because they're looking for something to do or they're getting frustrated or whatever it may be. Um, but this can eliminate boredom. It also, the self-play or self-leisure skills decreases that need to have you as the adult ever present. And the bigger thing about that, you as the adult or even that teacher in the classroom. And what's great about that is we're going to decrease that potential prompt dependency. You know, that's always a concern. We don't want to build a lot of prompt dependency. We want our kiddos as independent as possible. Um, so the more we can develop these skills early, um, the better chance that we have to decrease that potential prompt dependency. And let's be honest, if we can have our kiddos uh, self occupy and play alone and do some of those things on their own, this allows you as the caregiver to just reboot, to take a breath, to self care, to fill your bucket up again when you are starting to be exhausted and just take care of yourself. And guys, that is critical. That is absolutely critical. Um, critical as a parent that you take care of yourself uh, because we know as we take care of ourselves, we can take care of our loved ones even better. Okay. Here's a quote. This is a, a reference that I've given you um, from a great, great article. It's called Teaching Play Skills to Children with Disabilities, Research-Based Interventions and Practices. This came out just two years ago. Without highly structured instructional cues, children with disabilities tend to use fewer novel play behaviors, use less variety and complexity in their play, display less variety in their choice of toys and use fewer actions on toys. So if you take that quote and if you take that research and kind of build into some of those key points. So we're going to be talking about tonight those highly structured instructional cues. We're going to talk about variety and we're going to be talking about choices. And we're going to be talking about teaching the actions that go with toys and manipulatives and things like that. So that's the whole kind of focus of our training tonight. Okay. There's so many challenges, I think, when we're trying to teach our kiddos self play and self occupancy and specific to kiddos with SMS. A lot of times we may see that our kiddo has a very short attention span. You know, they might go to something for just a few minutes and then they're already ready to go to something else. Or they'll start on something independently, it lasts a couple of minutes, and then they want to go find an adult or find the sibling or tell somebody something. Um, 
that's part of that great desire to socialize as well. You know, that's a great gift, I think, of our kids with SMS, a wonderful gift. But it can also be a big challenge when we are hoping that they will kind of self-occupy for a while. We also see some impulsivity, you know, and some of that impulsivity, impulsivity can fall into the short attention span as well, where they, get, where they jump from item to item or task to task. And sometimes when this happens, or if they've got an idea in their mind, but it doesn't quite come out how they want it to, we can start to see some impatience or some outbursts if they're getting frustrated. Say they're doing a puzzle and it's just not working well, or they're trying, or they've got an idea in their mind of how they're, they're trying to uh, paint something or work on something or do a word search or whatever they're trying to do. And if they're not able to do it, we might see those challenging behaviors increase just out of sheer frustration. Um, pair that with uh, poor fine motor and gross motor skills. If you've got a kiddo that is really struggling with fine motor skills, but you have a lot of play-based activities that are very fine motor based, we kind of have to step back and think, am I asking my child to self-occupy and self-play and self-engage during really challenging tasks, because if that's the case, they're not gonna stick with it very long. You might wanna remove those tasks, put them in another area and reserve those for times that you're with them and you can help them and support them and, and kind of model a little bit more, okay? We really want to, and I'll say this all throughout our training tonight, we really want to specify um, activities that are low frustration, low frustration, low task demand, high interest. Okay, low frustration, high interest. That's the name of the game. We also have to look, is there motivation to self-play? Is there a motivation to be away from you as the parent or that older sibling or whatever? And if there's not, we can build that in. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, okay, Anissa, I've heard all this before. How do I get started? Let me tell you. Um, these are just a few things that might help you get started or if you've been doing this for years and years, maybe you've got an older student and you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, uh, but you're trying to get the hoodie and you're still not quite there yet. Uh, backtrack a little bit and kind of, again, reset and let's talk about some ways that you can get restarted if you need to do that. One of the things I recommend to parents, and I do a lot of parent training, I do a lot of parent seminars as well as my um, educational staff seminars that I do, but I work a lot with families and it's one of the best things that I love to do. Um, but one of the things I tell all of my families is first and foremost, make a list of activities that your kiddo can do in the home per section of the home. So what you're going to do is you're going to, and I'll give you a slide on this in a minute, but you can think about your house, do a map of your house. Okay. And it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be to scale all that stuff, but just kind of do a map of your house or even print out a blueprint of your house. That's kind of similar to what you have and start to think about what are the activities that are in each room that my child can do with little to no frustration that they would see as play. And again, I'll give you some exam examples here in a little bit, but that's the first thing you can do to get started. Then I want you to really think about organizing those materials that are in each of those rooms. How are you going to organize them to increase independence, first and foremost, to seek out the material or the toy, and then secondly, to clean up. Now, the cleanup part is usually a lower motivation than the play part, but we will get there, okay? Um, and the more we use things like organizers and labels and photos and things like that, um, it's going to increase your child's ability not just to seek out the toy, but also to clean up when prompted. Um, really think of your kid's motivation. What are their favorite things to do? If you've got a kiddo that plays video games six hours a day, even though you have tried and tried and tried your best to uh, transition your kiddo off, that's just a high fixation for them. Think about what kinds of video games are they playing? What kinds of strategies are they doing within the video game? Are there certain characters that they love, like Minecraft um, or Fortnite or some things like that? Um, Think about some of those and think about how can I make this into 
a hands-on self-play activity that is maybe not linked to video games. So for example, you see in my visual, like there's wooden puzzles that you can, you can make, there's file folder games that you can actually create by going onto Google Images and printing out different pictures, cutting them out, and then doing like a matching game. So you can still use that, that kiddo's area of high interest but put it in a different type of platform, a different type of presentation. Um, so they're doing different tasks at different times. Think about favorite movie characters. What kind of music do they like? Um, any kind of activity. Now here's the other part. This is where the gift of SMS socialization comes into play. Think of an activity or activities that the child can do that has a showing result, okay? Because this is the key to building motivation for independent play because you're building in kind of the golden ticket at the end. You're building in a reinforcer at the end, which is a social reinforcer. So for example, if you're asking the kiddo to do three different puzzles, that child has to go to completion and then the automatic reinforcer that comes after that is they can go show mom and then they can have that socialization. And, and again, I'm going to talk about how to really specify and, and make concrete that reinforcement after they've done some self play. I talked about low to no frustrational tasks and then things like visual or word based play schedules and make it age appropriate. I'm going to give you some examples of this as well here in a little bit, but you can see one that's to the right of the screen. Um, this is where the student might do something and then as soon as they're completed, like they read a book or they looked at pictures in a book, like a high interest book. Um, personal story, I'm working with my nephew right now who's a first grader, but he's reading about two grade levels below and um, reading is really, really challenging for him. It's just really hard and he has no interest in it, but he plays Minecraft. And I was able to go and find, with a lot of digging, I was able to go and find um, some different like level one Minecraft readers and things that you would see like our younger kiddos looking at, even if he just sits and looks at the pictures and we get into like reviewing print awareness then we put those books into his room. And if we say, let's do some reading time, he can go in and he can look at those books. But the key is using those high interest characters. Um, so just some ideas, some visual examples, some more of those are to come. And above all, make it functional, make it relative to the child and make it fun. If it's fun and it's rewarding, they're going to be more motivated to do it. And eventually they're going to have some intrinsic reinforcement. And that's what we really want. We want them to be intrinsically driven to want to go and play and do something and get to that sense of completion. Um, you know, we want them to be as independent as they can be. Okay, so this is like my magic, my magic house here. <laughs> this is an example of if you, if you have, um, you know, your picture of your house, and think of, you can even draw it. You don't have to do a pretty blueprint. You don't have to be an architect, whatever. Just draw your house and think about in each space that your child is going into, what can they do as far as independent play in each room? The other thing I want you to think about is what are some things that you don't want in certain rooms and you want to limit and put in maybe one designated area. For example, look at the bottom where it says living room. You know, if you've got a child that really perseverates on video games and sometimes they might um, show some frustration or show some behaviors when you're trying to transition them off, it might be that you don't have those video games in the child's bedroom because that's, that's a, a place that they might go to often. They might be tempted a lot, especially at nighttime. You know, those, those nights that our kiddos are not sleeping well, which is probably most nights, uh, you know, we don't want to tempt them with that highest reinforcer in those areas. You might want to limit those, those certain types of activities for like just the living room. And then again, you might limit it to certain times where you're putting it on a play schedule. But have some other things, looking at the living room, have some other things where they've got choices of movies. They might have different floor puzzles. Um, they might have some matching and solitaire types of games. 
Um, and then you might have like a sensory box or a busy box that's got different sensory based items that they can do in the living room. And I'll show you how to organize these in a little bit. In the bedroom, what kinds of activities can your child do independent in the bedroom? And you have those areas structured and you have those materials organized and those are some things that they can do within the bedroom and you're going to have them labeled so that each area that your child goes into they know okay when i get here and mom or dad or grandpa asks me to uh, do some play for 15 minutes while they go and do something else these are the choices that i have per room at the kitchen table you might have some some bins and buckets kind of hidden under the table or over to the side that are labeled and again, I'll talk about organizers here in a little bit. In the car, the car is still an area. The car is still a location. Think about things that are not going to hurt if they get thrown in the car. Um, I like to do things like those really soft books or magazines of high interest. If you've got a kiddo that's really into Harry Potter and you find a Harry Potter magazine, they can, even if they're not reading, they can just, again, looking at the pictures, going from page one to page two, kind of seeing the progression. Um, some of the file folder games are really good to have, but then you reserve those for the car. You can even do like a travel bag and you keep that, you know, like it could be an old backpack, it could be whatever, and you keep those in the car. So we're using kind of the principle of deprivation, having some high interest activities that are only in the car that you don't bring back out into bedroom or living room or whatever. So they're going to keep their value more if it's something that's just limited to one area. I hope that makes sense. And then parents room. This is probably where you're laughing going, yeah, my kiddo's in the room all the time. My kiddo walks into my bathroom all the time, whether I'm using it or not. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. <laughs> but this is where you can slowly start to set some limits. Or if you've got an older student, reset those limits. And don't just say, okay, you need to get out of my room. This is my room. You need to go that way. Um, have some things maybe right outside that door. So if your child goes to get you and they're just kind of barging in or they're doing whatever and you say, you know what, I'm not ready for you yet or hold on just a minute, I'm still getting ready, you can do this. I would have an activity right outside your door like on the wall. It could be something as easy as a dry erase board and a dry erase marker that's right outside the door. It could be that they can sit down and look at a photo album while they're waiting for you to come out. Um, it could be a matching activity that's on the door or something that's facing the outside versus having them come in. If you're trying to, again, set some small limits. It doesn't mean that your child's never gonna go into your bedroom. I guarantee that's gonna happen. Uh, but when we're trying to teach wait time, we can actually incorporate some independent play skills to teach wait time. Like, okay, mom's almost coming, I need to finish getting ready, but you can either choose the dry erase board or look at the photo album, what do you wanna do? And they have a certain spot right outside your door that they can do those things. And don't neglect thinking about outside as an area. Now again, some of y'all might need to do higher supervision outside. Some of y'all might be okay with your child being outside on the back porch um, with just some monitoring, you know, monitoring through the windows and things like that. So think about some activities that they can do outside. These are just ideas of activities. In a minute, I'm gonna show you how to teach them, how to model them and the structures that can go along with it. But there's also one little area that I forgot about. There it is. This is up in the roof or in the attic. This is the parents only super secret fortress of solitude and bliss. <laughs> That's an area that's like anywhere in the house that is off limits. The kids don't even know about it. Those few moments that you can just go and take a breath and <laughs> breathe in and breathe out. Uh, some of y'all don't have an area like that. I don't. I'm still working on it, but <laughs> that's the dream. That's the dream. So let's talk about how we teach this. How do we get there? Okay, we've, we've created our map. We've thought about different activities that our kiddo can do in certain areas of our home. How are we gonna teach this? First of all, present that activity, that toy, that material, whatever it may be to the kiddo in that designated room, in that designated area. 
even if, again, you've got an older student that has a lot of things in that area, make sure that you have some activities within that bedroom, some activities within the kitchen area, some activities within the living room, um, but present or represent that activity to the child in that specific area. And then you're gonna model and teach how to use the item. Again, even if they've seen it before, it could be like Mr. Potato Head or whatever it may be, just say, hey, I'm gonna show you this and then it's gonna be your turn. So then you model how to play and you talk through what you're doing. Then you're gonna say, okay, I'm all done. Now it's your turn, show me what you're gonna do. You have them practice, them do different things, you know, with the, with the um, Mr. Potato Head or whatever material you have. And then when they do that, you're gonna praise. Wow, look what you did. You did that all by yourself, that's awesome. Um, that was great. Uh, then what you're going to do after you praise them, because we're gonna build on this very slowly. If you've got a kiddo that is constantly on your hip or, or following you around everywhere, then we're gonna do this in little chunks, okay? We're gonna slowly increase independence and kind of being away from you a little bit, okay? We can't just say, you know what, go in your room for 20 minutes, okay? You've been following me all day. We've got to do it in gradual spurts, and then we can add on time, okay? So praise after they've shown you how to do that. Then tell them, okay, do it one more time. I'm going to wait right out here in the hallway. Do it one more time, and then I'm going to come back and check. So it's your turn again. So ask the child to do the task again. Go walk out into the hallway kind of monitor once they're finished, tell them, go show me when you're done. And the kiddo goes and shows you and then praise again. So you're leaving that child with the task for just a little bit. And remember, it's a clear cut start and finish. They kind of know when they're done. That's sometimes a challenge with play also, when there's just kind of um, general materials around, um, say lots of cars to play with on, um, on a floor rug that's got different streets. Now those are great toys. Those are great things to play with, especially for our little guys. But the challenge with some of those activities, and not that I want you to get rid of them, but the challenge with some of those activities is kids are not quite sure how to start. And sometimes they're not sure how to stop. Like, how long do I do this? When am I finished? How do I know when I'm done and I'm supposed to go show mom? Or, or if I'm not sure what I'm doing, I'm just gonna get up and go check on mom or dad. So the child does the task on their own. You've left to go in the hallway or to go, you know, in your bedroom. You've left the child with the task. They've done the independent play because you've already modeled it. And then you've shown, you've watched them do it themselves. So then when they're finished, they come in to show you that they've completed that task. You praise again. Look at that. You did that all by yourself. That's awesome. I love it. Here's my little side caveat though. If they come to you without completing, like you've left them alone, you told them you're, you know, to show you when they're done and they just get up and go into your room anyway, um, try to use a real, they're not in trouble. We don't wanna use a punishment principle, but just use a real flat affect voice. Just say, oh, let's try again and redirect them back to the area and say, your turn, show me, and then come show me when you're finished. Okay, just real flat affect redirect them back to the area. And then if the task is too hard, then offer them some support. But that's good data for you to go, you know what, I'm asking him to do something, he or she to do something independently and they're not quite there yet with this toy. So maybe I leave that for, for something else in a few weeks. Again, if it's too hard, simplify it, choose something easier. Um, this should be something easy for the kiddo can do. Okay, so we've talked about setting up different areas. We've talked about how to teach, how to model, then have them do it themselves and come show you. Now let's talk about the supports around uh, these play areas and the items themselves. A great way to start teaching how long do I play or when that I'm done, if it's one of those like with the cars and things like that, is to use things like egg timers or some of the visual time timers that you might see uh, in, in your students' classrooms. Um, you can even use your iPhone or if your kiddos have a, have a phone or an iPad or some kind of technology using that timer. Um, but also 
what I really, really encourage is using visual supports that remind that kiddo how to play. Remember, visual supports take the place of the adult or the other person having to constantly verbally prompt. Okay, first you stack the red, then you stack the blue. We don't want to have them become prompt dependent on our voice and us prompt them all the time. Those visual supports can become the prompt where they're just following almost a map, following a rubric of play, okay? You can do this with pictures. You can also do this with video modeling. Now, I don't know if this particular area got in your slides. This might just be in my slides, but video modeling is an awesome way to show a kiddo how to do something. So they show, they model, they demonstrate. It's very visual, and then you ask the child to do it. And if, if time permits, I've got a couple of examples that I can show you toward the end here. And then having some of, those, some of those communication visuals, you know, even our students that um, are what I would probably call hyper uh, verbal, where they're like da, 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 all the time and they just want to tell you everything all the time. Um, when a kiddo is starting to get frustrated, we know that expressive language can go down, you know, or it can be replaced instead of functional language can be replaced by things like screaming or throwing materials or things like that. So have maybe some backup communication visuals, even if your kiddo's verbal, have some backup communication visuals to support some of those, like, like a help card or a break card, okay? Um, I'll show you in a little bit some different ways that we can structure the materials, but really try to use things like clear bins that your kiddos can see the materials inside and put a picture on the outside or a label. If they're a reader, put those labels out there on the outside. If they're non-readers, do some maybe digital photos. But guys, anything that you need as far as a visual, you can probably find it on Google Images. Um, if you need a picture of, um, you know, Legos, you just go to Google Images and you type in Legos. Um, if you need a pic picture of Cheetos, you just go into Google Images, you're gonna get everything, they have everything. Um, think about, especially for older students or kiddos that like to do like word finds or, or uh, connect the dots, using those high interest characters, remember. Um, try using things like paper trays. Uh, you can also do that for art activities, for holding magazines, things like that. And think of your first then concept. I bet everybody on this webinar is familiar with the pre-mac principle or the first then. Typically we think of first then of like first do some work, then you can have some play time or you can have a reinforcer. Uh, but in this case, when we talk about play, play is the work. It's independent, okay? So we're going to say like first do art for 10 minutes then you can go show mom and dad. And again, if there's a built-in social reinforcer, there's a social component to that. Um, so you can slowly increase time as your child gets older and their attention span gets longer. And as you see more success with that self-occupying, okay? It might be 10 minutes to start and then you can increase to 15 minutes and then to 20 minutes and so on. Okay, they're not gonna get there overnight, but they will get there. And then, having said that with the first then, keep your end of the bargain. If they bring it and say, look, this is what I did, this is where you are going to socialize, stop what you're doing for a minute and say, wow, that's awesome, dude, or look at that. Praise, draw attention to the finished product and really stress how they did it by themselves or while well, you were in your room for a long time working on that. That looked awesome. I'm proud of you, you know, whatever it is. Um, the power of positive reinforcement can never be underestimated. Every kiddo, regardless of disability, non-disability, whatever, positive reinforcement is proven to make behavior stick. Okay. All right. You might also want to keep that big, big reinforcer, say uh, it's a play, an independent play thing like uh, watching something on the iPad or watching a YouTube video or playing, a, you know, 30 minutes of a video game. Maybe hold that for later and start with smaller activities first. So they're getting into things like uh, puzzles or therapeutic or sensory things and then 
you know, you kind of reserve that bigger carrot uh, for later, okay? So let me show you some different examples let me see how we're doing on time. Oh, we're good. Let me show you some different examples of some of that visual structure that I've been talking about, because all these visual supports can really help increase motivation and interest to increase that self-engagement. These are some visuals that you might see in a classroom or even y'all might have tried to use them. Uh, and just making a list of different things your child likes to do. But the challenge of a list like this that's on the left hand side is that it's so much and a lot of kiddos might not know, is this a choice board? Do I get to pick a few or do I have to go down the list and do all of these? And if so, I'm going to stop probably at blocks and and then when I get to blocks, how much am I supposed to do? Blah, blah, blah. So I kind of discourage like these laundry lists of play activities. I, you know, take some visuals like this. These are good visuals. Maybe use these to label your different bins and areas. But then when you're teaching play skills, or again, for some of y'all that have older kids, reteaching how to play by themselves, you might pick two things and you might limit it to 15 minutes just to start. But you really have to know your kiddo and kind of know their baseline and their attention span. Some kiddos can go longer than this. If you're working with a little guy that's super impulsive, then 15 minutes might be too long. So kind of, you know, know your kid, you know him best anyway. And think about, are they able to maybe get through two independent play activities um, for about 15 minutes? You set the timer, they can do some bead lacing, then they might do some Legos. 15 minutes, timer goes off, they're finished, then they can go show mom. They can show mom the beads. Oh, mom, I made you a necklace. They can show the Legos that they made. And this is kind of the bulk of their play time. And then you wait a little bit and then you can pick something else, go do something else. Okay, so you're gonna be doing this in spurts. You're gonna be doing this in chunks. Um, again, make sure that it's kind of motivating to your child too. Here are some examples of some organizers, okay? So these are just like the plastic bins. Um, so you can already see through them. I really like these because when we're trying to teach our kids cleaning up and putting things away, when they can see through the bins and the materials, it makes it just that much easier. Um, so this is, you can see the materials, but then also they've used just pictures on the front to label what goes in these drawers. It helps when a student is uh, seeking out the materials, but again, also when they're cleaning up. Um, for this, the one on the far right, this is a great one. This is just one of those plastic shoe racks that goes over the door, but it holds different art materials. And you can see how the kiddo can see everything in here and they know where to get items. That is going to increase like independent art play and coloring and things like that because they're not having to go, mom, where's the crayons or dad, where's the scissors and where's that? You know, it's got an organized area. Now, again, a lot of y'all might have to really monitor art type activities at first, um, you know, for various reasons. But once your, once your child gets really um, comfortable and independent making different things, then you can kind of monitor from afar. These bins, the ones in the middle, and then the ones in your bottom right-hand corner, I really love these for older kiddos. So you might have, say, a Minecraft uh, word find or a Harry Potter, you know, connect the dots. You can put these in those stacked bins. And so a child knows, okay, I'm going to have four things that I do. And when I'm finished, um, I can show mom. Or when I'm finished, I tell mom I'm done. They can put them in a finish box even. And then they know they're done with independent play for that section of the day, then they can go and do something else for a little bit until you have them do another independent play time. Same thing with these bins at the bottom. They might hold different, um, different materials for older kids. You can use different labels on the outside. Um, just a great way to get organized, okay? I know this is work up front, y'all. I know. But again, the more work you do up front where it's structured and you're teaching your kids how to get materials, how to play, how to put things away. They're just gonna become more self-organized, more self-occupied, um, and it's gonna make, it's gonna enrich their life, and it's really gonna enrich your life too. 
Here's some more examples. Um, it might be that um, if the kiddo's in the kitchen, you might just have something like a busy box. Um, you can also do this right outside your door um, if, if you don't want them coming in a lot and you're just saying, hey, I'm not quite ready yet. Um, you, can, you can pick something from the busy box and hang out in the hallway till I'm finished dressing or till I'm finished whatever. And you put different materials in there. These are for kiddos that do better with a few different choices and maybe you've already taught them some play skills, but they've got a box where they can go in and just pick something, look through, then they put it back. They're already starting to have more success with self-occupying self activities. Some other things I really like are using things like walls, whether it's in the hallway, whether it's in a playroom, if you have a dedicated playroom, whether again, it's right outside your door before they walk into your bedroom to keep them from going in your bedroom all the time, having different uh, things on the wall, like this is a giant word search or having that dry erase board. And then this, some of y'all might've been hearing about busy boxes. We think of those a lot with our younger kiddos and our toddlers, you know, where they might have a cube and you turn things and you manipulate beads and you do all these things because they work on interest and color and tracking and fine motor skills. But this parent actually made their own uh, where there's, they made their own busy box where they put some texture at the top they, they did some different matching of names and pictures of family, and they did some matching of shapes, and you can just work on that. Now, um, I don't expect all of y'all to make something like that, but if you do, I will ask you to send me a copy because I think this is totally cool. And I'm definitely not that creative, but if you've got, if you're super creative like this, or if you have a family member that's willing to do something like this for your kiddo, I would love to see it because I think it's awesome. Okay, so that's some of the organization. Now I want to talk about some additional visual supports that can really help in teaching how to play. So for example, if you've got Legos on the play schedule, okay, and you have a child that just kind of puts them together, takes them apart, puts them together, takes them apart, again, it's not functional. You as the parent or the caregiver are going to teach them either how to make a tower or in this case you might even have a jig okay you might even have a jig that they follow uh, such as this one to the left where they can kind of start working on different patterns okay um, and that way they know there's a clear-cut start and a clear-cut finish or you might say build a tower uh, use 10 pieces and they have to go to 10 pieces over to the far right, I've got different examples of visual supports for different centers within the house or different activities. So say again, they pick Mr. Potato Head. It's got different, it's almost like a mini schedule. It's got different items that the child can use and do when they're in, until they're finished dressing Mr. Potato Head. Or how do I play with toy cars? Um, how do I play with blocks? This one here in the middle, I love because it's, it's a toy that we might buy some of our younger kiddos or some of our elementary age kiddos. And we find these really cool toys that sometimes our kids just kind of play with them for a couple of minutes or once or twice. And then they go into the closet and, and we don't bring them out again. So what I like about this is bring some of those toys out and try to add some visuals. Like this is a doctor's kit. And there's a visual with it to support things to do with the doctor kit. And it shows, you know, wrapping a foot, taking a temperature, giving a pretend shot. Yes, it is a pretend shot. Um, pretending to do medicine, checking ears, things like that. So it gives them a map on how to play. It gives them a map on how to self play. Here's some additional visuals, say for our older kids, all right? Um, our older kids are young adults and um, teaching them how to play dominoes um, independently. You know, they can use a little jig like this or making the great tower where they, they line everything up or they make a design and then they can knock it down. So there's kind of some instant gratification with that. Um, you know, you can pick out different designs again on Google images 
um, and find different things. If you've got a kiddo that is really interested in helping you cook or you want them to be more independent as far as making some of their own snacks, you know, popping popcorn in the microwave or doing pudding and things like that, then you can use some of these visuals, put them in the kitchen or the, the kitchen nook, breakfast nook area, and then they can start working on these things. That's still functional play for our older kids. You know, that's still a, a very great activity for them to do. And then you might just make up some of your own visuals based on that high interest character that your kiddo loves. So again, I'm using Minecraft because that's just the thing still now, Minecraft and Fortnite. So you might go on to Google Images and print out these pictures, and then you might print out a second page, cut them all up, you know, and then have your child, you know, just do some matching, you know, or do a memory game where you flip over and you teach them how to do matches as, as an actual memory game. Is that something they can definitely do on their own? Okay, I'm going to show you. Let me go back a little bit. So remember I talked about the doctor kid and having some visuals like that. So these are some concrete visuals that you can keep up um, with those specific toys in those bins. But just like I showed you how to teach and model and demonstrate for your child, um, if your child is really into videos, then you can use a research-based concept called video modeling. Now, some of y'all might be really familiar with video modeling. Some of y'all might not have used it very much. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to see a lot of the research and literature in relation to kids with autism or on the spectrum. But this is not an autism specific strategy. It's absolutely not. I even use this with some of my little bitty uh, early childhood kiddos that are really just struggling on how to figure out routines and how to play. So video, video modeling is really um, just a great concept um, on how to show a kiddo what to do. I've got two links here. One of them is for a younger student, like teaching how to play with the doctor kid. I'm going to show you about a minute of that one. And then I'm going to show you an older one uh, for older students on teaching something like solitaire, okay, which is a little bit harder. So let me do some screen share into my videos. Okay. I want to make sure y'all can see that. All right. I'm going to show you just a minute of this one. Katie is going to play with the doctor's kit. First, she opens it up. Katie takes out the stethoscope. She puts it in her ears. Katie listens to Teddy's heart. Next, Katie looks in Teddy's ears. I'm going to stop it right there, but you can kind of see how, you know, we're showing a child how to do something, um, you know, and the more they see it, they, they'll have those imitation skills down. Now that's for like a younger student. Let me show you one that you could use like for an older student. Hello guys and welcome to B and E Game Reviews and today I'm going to be showing you how to play the easy version of solitaire. So to start off you're going to take a regular 52 deck of cards, uh, take the jokers out, yeah to make it 52. Then you're going to take the top card, well you're going to have to shuffle first, sorry I forgot to mention that. So. this card, lay there, flip this card, there you go. All right, I'm going to stop it right there in the interest of time. 
I go back to my PowerPoint. All right, so that was an example, a couple of examples of video modeling. And I know in just a little bit, we're going to have the Q&A. We're going to do some troubleshooting in Q&A, but um, I want to give time for a video that Allison is going to show you. Um, but before that, there's some quick references and citations that I use throughout the research for this seminar. Um, so there's some little light reading if y'all want to do that at night. And then um, if y'all have any additional information, if you have questions, if there's anything I can answer, these are all my content, all the ways to contact me. I'm pretty, pretty transparent. So there's lots of different ways to contact me. Um, but we will do question and answers here in a little bit. Uh, so we will, I'm going to hand it over to Allison right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anissa, for that fantastic yeah. presentation. I, those are great tips. I really, I really think they're going to help in my household. Um, I really love the idea of the clear start and stop time with, um, with play and the reinforcers at the end. Uh, I think that's really going to help. And the video, the play video is great too. So thank you for that. And this is such an important issue right now for so many SMS families. So thank you for extending your work to smith McGinnis syndrome. So before we move on to the question and answer portion of our webinar, I have a short video to play for you to introduce you to Betsy and Ezra Anderson. Okay, Ezra, you ready? Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Betsy Anderson, and this is Ezra Anderson. Ezra, and how old are you, Ezra? Mm, eight. When was your birthday? August twenty. August fourteenth. Uh huh. And what grade are you going to start? Third grade. Are you excited? Yep. We uh, wanted to take a minute to say hello and to talk a little bit about PRISMS and what it's kind of meant to our family in this Smith McGinnis journey. Um, Ezra was diagnosed right about two and a half and it was about February that year and there was a conference coming up for PRISMS. So when, what I did, is that, mommy? when I did my research, I found what a it, conference. Mommy? I'm talking about the conference that we went to, the first one. What's it called? And the PRISMS conference. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were babies. We were brand new to everything. And we walked into the conference. And I will tell you, it was a bit of a fire hose. It was super overwhelming. But from the first moment, the first meeting, um, at our table was another young couple, turns out, lived 30 minutes away from us here in Chicagoland, and they've been a huge source of connection, support, friendship ever since that time years ago. Um, and we, there's been so many other friendships that have started that way, um, just through either in person at a conference or through the Facebook group. Um, but another very important thing about PRISMS is just the connection, not only to other parents and families, but to the professional network of people. Um, that PRISMS book um, that um, was written kind of like a handbook that you can give out to others working with your child. I've given to every teacher he's had and they've all um, talked about how helpful it was. Um, we met a neuropsychologist who did a presentation at one of the conferences and then uh, subsequently connected us with a neuropsychologist here in the city to do some evaluations that were very helpful. You know, we got connected with the safety sleeper bed after being able to test one out at a conference. And um, that's <laughs> been life changing um, for managing things with Ezra. Ezra, are you sleeping? Oh, he's taking a break. Um, so th those are just probably not even is comprehensive of all the things that PRISMS has meant to our family. Uh, it's really just been a source of encouragement, support, um, shoulders to cry on, people to relate to, people to um, say keep going, people to say, hey, have you tried this? Um, there's just nothing like it. And you don't have to explain. You don't have to explain um, a ton of things because we just get it. We just get it on a, a a certain level. So, thank you, Essie. 
<laughs> so that is just um, something we wanted to say. Thank you, Prisms, um, for all that you have done and will continue to do, and um, we appreciate it. Right, Izzy? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andersons, for putting that really great video together and sharing your story with us. Um, Y'all are, Ezra is, is so precious. That is such a sweet little video. And thank you for sharing how Prisons has been there to support your family. It's really great to hear as well. Um, so now we have some time for Anisa to answer a few questions. Um, we have a few of them tonight. We might not get to all of them, but let's get started with our questions. Um, let's take a look here. So the first question for you, Anisa, is, um, are there websites or other resources that you could recommend where I can easily create the playboards? Oh, yes, the playboards. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I always check Google to see if somebody has done it for you. Because even Google Images is going to link things like Pinterest or uh, Teachers Pay Teachers or somebody please pay the parents kind of websites and things like that. Uh, so go to Google Images first and see if someone's already done it. Um, if they haven't, um, there's a few things you can do. You can, um, some of y'all are familiar with the board maker software. A lot of schools use that, but, but it's really expensive and we don't necessarily all buy that for our home. But if you do a search again on Google Images for like board maker, uh, baby doll, it'll have a line drawing of that. Um, if your child needs a lot more um, uh, visual discrimination, if, if, they, um, if they need a little bit more clarity and visual clarity with that, if their visual discrimination skills are probably not as sharp as like line drawings, which can be kind of abstract. Um, that I just like to take photos, you know, I just grab my, I grab my cell phone and I take some photos and then I download them, print them out. And then I've got some pictures of different things. Um, and again, you can even do a quick video. Again, you get your cell phone and you record yourself or you record the materials down here, how you're playing and you just kind of do it in succession and you let that child watch over and over uh, to kind of teach. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for those for those resources, those tips. I appreciate it. Um, here is our next question. Any tips about physical warmups before leisure activities or during a break? I'm asking about using physical movements before and during these activities. So physical warmups, physical movements. Well, it depends. Um, it depends on age of the kid and like what are they warming up for. Um, when they're younger, I like to do a lot of the things that your kiddo might be doing at school, like, like Go Noodle. Um, Go Noodle is, is free. It's on YouTube. There's lots of different little warm up activities, lots of singing and dancing that goes with that. But again, it's a type of video modeling where you're going to be following someone while they're doing it. Um, there is also what I really love. It's very movement based, but it's slow and it's repetitive. And it actually works to build focus. If you've got a kiddo that's kind of all over the place and you want to build some movement, but also build some focus and it's go noodle flow and it's mindfulness activities, like things like rainbow breathing and they teach rainbow breathing. These are also great, not just for a student to practice and move around with, but also um, if they're needing to take a break and they don't necessarily, maybe they've got a lot of energy and, and they're not going to go sit down and take a break somewhere, even though you really want them to, if they're really kind of upset or, or really wired about something, um, you might put on one of those uh, go noodle flows or different types of some of those activities and let them do some repetitive movements, do some deep breathing, but it's highly visual. And um, I found a lot of students uh, respond to that. Yeah, that's great. I'm definitely going to check out Go Noodle uh, yeah. for my daughter. There's Go Noodle for the fast stuff and Go Noodle Flow for like the mindfulness and deep breathing and kind of calming down type things. So that sounds perfect. Pull it up on your phone or on your iPad, whatever it may be. I love it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is I really want to increase independent play, but I can't get my kid off technology without a tantrum. 
Do you have any tips for getting off of technology so that I can start play activities? Absolutely. That is such a great question. And unfortunately, it's a really common question. And I bet every parent out there that I can't see your face, you're going, mm hmm. <laughs> This is a really common one. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, what I really try to encourage is, you know, if, if it's a Saturday morning, like as soon as they wake up or if they're home doing virtual school, um, after they do that virtual school or once they take a break, have them do a small play activity first. And you might even use first then, like first Legos 10 minutes, then, you know, video game for 20 minutes. But then you might do a pause and then create some other type of game or bring something else in. They might even do it right there while they have the game paused. And it could be short bursts. This is gonna take a while, especially if you've got an older student that is hyper-focused on technology. This is not gonna be an overnight kind of thing. You're gonna be doing it in little short bursts. So I would have them do kind of the hands-on types of things first in short chunks, and then they can earn time on the video game. Then you have them press pause, have them do something else really quick, then they can unpause. Then you can start increasing your time slowly so that they're starting to do more and more of the play type activities. And then you're starting to limit technology to say just the afternoon or just when virtual school is finished. Um, so it's not, you know, six hours a day. But I know that's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. Um, so it's easier to start with the activity and then let them do some technology than to try to have them start with technology and then transition off to go do something else. That's, that's harder. So. Okay, that sounds great. We, got, we have two questions that are very similar. So the other one was, any good suggestions on how to detox when we've overused screen time and lesser rewards have become less attractive? We're running into this issue with e-learning. I know that's become a big a big issue with all of us um, because it's giving him so much screen time and all he wants is more when he's done. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing you can do, and again, this is highly visual and it builds kind of some visual clarity and some progression of activity. So say they're doing virtual learning and they've got the laptop in front of them. Um, it might be that right next to the laptop, uh, you have a busy box with maybe just three items that are very hands-on. You might have Therapeutic, you might have, um, you know, some other kind of fidget or whatever it might be. And then you might have a simple puzzle or something. And it's right next to the technology. So the minute the child takes a break, they take a break, the materials are right there, but it's choice driven. That's the other part that might build motivation a little bit more is that, oh, you've already finished. You're going to get a 10 minute break you get to pick anything in your busy box. It could also be a snack, you know, it can be something like that, um, but have that right there. So it's like first technology, then busy box, then they do technology again, then they might walk away and do something else. Um, this is also where I like to do if they're sitting a lot for the virtual learning, because our kids sit so much. And most of our guys aren't sitters. They don't like to sit all the time. <laughs> so if they're sitting a lot for virtual learning, see what you can do as far as some of those, those wall activities. Can you make some of those wall activities or put some of the learning from, um, you know, a horizontal position to more of a vertical position just to get, get some movement going. So. I love that idea because my daughter actually does like to sit a lot. And with this e-learning, I feel like we do have a lot of sedentary time. Um, and yeah. I'd love to get her up. I love the idea of the wall activities. Yeah. At least she's standing or, or standing learning. Yeah, like absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so here is, see, we have another question. Um, my, my kid tends to be very destructive and often, often breaks toys unless I'm right there. Any ideas on how to stop this so they can play by themselves? Excellent question, excellent question. So couple things on that. First of all, when I see a kiddo breaking a toy or, or when a parent sees a kiddo breaking a toy, when we see that type of behavior, we have to think, do they know how to use the toy? Are they, are they purposely going into breaking it as soon as that parent removes attention? Um, I always characterize behaviors into two categories. Is the child doing the behavior because is it an I can't behavior? Like, I don't know how to play with this toy. I can't do it by myself. So I'm engaging in a behavior or is it an I won't? 
oh, I know how to play with it, but I'm mad that you left, so I'm throwing it. <laughs> so first and foremost, try to decipher when the child is breaking the materials, is this an I can't behavior or is this an I won't? So if it's an I can't, like they're not able to play or they're not sure what to do after you've left, then that's a teaching component. That would be where you're gonna remodel, you're gonna demonstrate, you're gonna have them show it back and use those little bursts like I talked about at the beginning where you say, okay, you do it now, I'm gonna be right back. And you literally just go around the corner. You can even peek around and say, okay, I'm watching. You do it by yourself, I'm watching. And it's like this long. Maybe they just put the ears on, on potato head and that's it. And then you come back out and praise. So you're gonna do it in really short bursts. If it's a lack of, of motivation, okay? It's not an I can't behavior, it's an I won't. Oh, I was playing with this and then you removed my attention? How dare you? <laughs> Let me show you how upset I am. <laughs> That's where you can still use that same technique where you might go around the corner, but you just give them one thing and say, okay, first do this and then show me and I'm, uh, do you want a high five or do you want your magic hug or whatever it may be? Um, build in some more motivation for that one little completion that they do, even if it's 10 seconds of independent play. Because you have to think, how, how long is my child able to sustain before they engage in a disruptive behavior, before they engage in breaking something? So if, if they go for 10 minutes and then they start breaking stuff, then don't wait 10 minutes. Do five minutes, have them come show you, then praise, um, and then start to kind of elongate that time. I hope that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. It's really, really good advice. I like the idea of the baby steps. Yeah, um, definitely baby steps. We're not, this is a marathon and not a sprint. Okay. Um, especially if you've got a kiddo that has had these types of behaviors in their repertoire for a long time, it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but, but these parents I know are, are patient and persistent and that's the name of the game. <laughs> right. Exactly. Thank you so much. So one last question. We just had a question about um, putting the links in the in the comments here and we'll we'll do that. Um, the link, someone asked for the link for solitaire and we could all, we can just probably add all of the links um, as an answer to this question. Um, so take a look at that. Um, you'll, it, it should show up for everybody in the question and answer section and we'll put the links there. So, okay, well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have for this evening. So thank you so much, Anissa, for that really great presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's presentation just as much as I did. Um, hopefully it'll help us make it through these extraordinary times just a little bit easier. Um, be on the lookout for an email from me with a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as a survey. I'll also include um, Anissa's uh, PowerPoint presentation. She shared that with me and I can share it with all of you. So please join us on future PRISONS webinars. Make sure to follow us on social media and join PRISONS if you're not already a member. Membership is free and it's the best way to stay up to date with all things SMS. Prisons is a nonprofit. All of our programs, including this webinar series, are fully funded by our generous donors. If you're interested in supporting prisons and the programs it provides families impacted by smith beginner syndrome, then please visit our website, prisons.org, and consider making a donation. That concludes our webinar for this evening. Everyone, please stay safe and have a great evening and good night.